Hi, thanks for letting us join you today. Uh, I'm Stephen Castle, and this is Debbie Kosky, and we are with Calibration Technologies, your gas detection specialists. Uh, as such, we want to uh, dissect some of the IIAR codes and standards today, and Debbie is the best person to talk to about that. So I'm going to turn the floor over and let her walk through the most important parts of the codes in regards to your gas detection system. Here. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, we're just going to go over um, the small part of the IIAR 2014 standards that deal with ammonia gas detection. Uh, this is the code book to which we will be referring. I kind of put it in my own binder because it, there's so much to this. I mean, there's a lot to this. And um, it doesn't only deal with ammonia detection. It deals with all kinds of other safety issues in regards to uh, your ammonia detection system, valves, um, electricity, um, pipe supports, all kinds of things. So we just went through and pulled out just the parts about ammonia detection so that you can concentrate on one piece at a time because it's a little bit overwhelming. So um, we're going to get started here. Um, first thing is why do we even need ammonia gas detection? Um, people will tell us, well, I can smell it, so I don't need a detector, right? So um, it's a good point. You can smell ammonia. You can definitely smell ammonia and you don't like it when you smell ammonia, right? It stinks and it burns your nose and your eyes. But um, you can also say that about smoke. You can smell smoke, but does that mean you don't need a smoke detector? You can smell um, carbon monoxide in your home, but it's still a good idea to have a carbon monoxide detector. And, and this is why, because in your ammonia facilities, there's not always somebody there. So what if there's a leak when no one is there? And then even if you can smell it, you can't measure it. And that's an important point about ammonia. It's not enough to know that it's there. You need to know how much is there because you can smell it at five parts per million, but that's really an okay level. Like you don't really need to take any action at five parts per million. You wanna pay attention, um, but we have to measure it. And then these standards and codes require that you take different uh, measures based on how much is there. So a mechanical detector will um, not only detect the ammonia, but tell you how much is there and take the appropriate action automatically without you having to go to a book and go, okay, how much is there? What it's 150 PPM, what does that mean I have to do? The mechanical detectors will just automatically do that for you uh, and keep a log of it. So it's really a good idea to have mechanical detection in any area where you are using ammonia. So who gets to decide how this detection system is set up and what the pieces are and what the different reactions are? Well, um, that used to be a really complicated question because there were a lot of people who had opinions about this. The International Fire Code had standards on ammonia. ASHRAE uh, had standards for ammonia. Um, your uh, Uniform Mechanical Code had opinions on how to handle ammonia detection. But thanks to IIAR, which stands for the International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration, they've worked really hard to kind of make all those um, governing bodies agree with each other. And so beginning uh, in 2021, more and more of those uh, organizations are gonna point to IIAR. For example, ASHRAE, the um, Association of the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning, ASHRAE, they are just going to say in their portion of their standard regarding ammonia, they're, all they're going to say about it is do whatever IIAR says. So um, IIAR is really the authority um, on ammonia safety and specifically ammonia detection. So thank you IIAR for simplifying everything for us. So we're going to move right into the presentation here and talk about how you need to set up your detection system so that it meets the IIAR standard. So let's see if I can figure out how to do this. If I do that and that and that. Nope, share and there we go. Still not working? One second. There we go, all right. So, will your ammonia gas detection system pass inspection? 
you know, uh, probably you're going to be inspected by OSHA. They're going to pull out their IIAR standard when they look at your detection system. What are they going to look for? Let's see. Um, oh, first we're going to start with a quiz question. All right. So which organization has the most authority when it comes to safety standards for ammonia refrigeration? IIAR, International Fire Code, or the NRA? Well, I think it should be pretty easy to say that it's IIAR. So, all right, so moving on. Uh, IIAR has standards for specific areas, mach your machinery rooms, your areas other than your machinery rooms, equipment pits located indoors, package systems, all these have different rules. So we're gonna look first at machinery rooms. This one has the strictest standards because it's where most of your ammonia is located. So, um, boy, we're looking at um, section 6.8.2 here and uh, in the code. So if you wanna refer back to that, you sure can and read it word for word. But basically this is what it says. Um, your machinery rooms, you can classify as a hazardous location or ordinary location. Um, you really wanna be an ordinary location because uh, it just makes it um, just simpler. If you're a hazardous location, you have to deal with all kinds of other issues regarding your electrical wiring, your walls, all of the, how it's constructed. But in order to get your machinery room classified as an ordinary location, it has to have proper ventilation and ammonia detection. So most people choose to do this and get it um, classified as ordinary. So um, then if you're ordinary, your ammonia detection, you can't just have any old detection there. It has to comply with section 6.13 of IIAR2. So this, again, uh, if you want to get out the codes and read it, you sure can. But basically, it says your ammonia detection system has to have a dedicated branch circuit so that if there is a loss of power to your system, um, it will signal an alarm to a monitored location. Okay, so what's a monitored location? It's a means of continuous oversight, uh, notification of staff, third party alarm system, responsible party. It can send a call to somebody's cell phone. It can, uh, again, um, a security system that you guys have contracted with, just a responsible person. Okay, and then it also has to have an emergency ventilation, which we talked about. Um, and then you have to have at least one detector in there set to activate at 25 parts per million. So when your detector notices that when it smells 25 points per million, it also has to alarm your monitored location. Um, then you have to have audio, visual alarms inside your machinery room. Again, I've got them broken out. There's two separate units, but really it's usually one that has light and sound in one unit. Uh, you also have to have that outside of every entrance to your machinery room. So, um, and okay, they even care about how loud your audio alarm is. So it has to be 15 decibels above your ambient noise level in your machinery or five decibels above the maximum. So that's a loud horn. Um, they shall be identified by signage. So you have to label them so that if, so if it starts going off, people know why this blue light is going off. So um, this is an example of what uh, audio visual um, device could look like. It's labeled for ammonia and it's inside your machinery room and outside of every entrance. Okay. So if it detects 25, it has to do uh, activate all your alarms. And um, the good thing about keeping it at 25 parts per million or it's low level leak you go in there, you figure out what's wrong, you fix the problem, you clear the ammonia, and these, um, as soon as you get below 25 parts per million, your alarms can reset, no trouble. Okay. So then, um, you also have to de-energize your exhaust fans and close your fan dampers. So in addition to a detector that activates at 25 parts per million, you also have to have um, an alarm set point at 150 parts per million. Now this could be, we accomplish this with the same detector, just one detector set at those two different points, but they take different actions based on that. Um, if you hit the 150 level, then you have to turn on your emergency ventilation. 
And then you also have to, once you go in, you uh, investigate, you solve the problem, you clear the ammonia out of the area. It, these are, it, once it hits 150, they can no longer automatically reset. You have to have a manual reset switch. So somebody has to go in there and manually turn off the alarms after you're under 150 parts per million. So then you've also got standards if you hit these really high levels. This is getting close to your lower explosive limit at 40,000 ppm. So not only, so really we, we advise using a different detector for this high level alarm because it's like the detectors that are good at your low ranges aren't necessarily good at detecting the high range and the detectors that are good at detecting the high range aren't necessarily good at the low range. So this will prevent some false alarms if you use two separate technologies. Our lower range detectors use electrochemical technology in the cells. The higher range uses a catalytic feed technology. So that's why we recommend two different detectors, one for your lower levels and one for your higher level. And so once you hit that 40,000 ppm measurement, okay, nobody's going to be able to get in that room. I mean, it's going to be unbearable and dangerous to be in that room. So at this point, they worry about an explosion. So in addition to doing all of these things, signaling your alarms, turning on your emergency ventilation, you also have to de-energize anything that could cause a spark. So um, let's see what we've got next. Again, up at the top there in this blue bar, this is where um, the actual quotes and references to the codes are, if you are interested in looking any of those up. Okay, so uh, IIAR also cares about where you locate these detectors. They need to be placed in the path of the uh, ammonia. You have to think about, okay, if ammonia is in this room, how is it going to flow in the room? It usually flows towards your fans. So um, it's a good idea to put them in the path of that ammonia near the fans. Also, you have to put them in a place that's easily accessible for maintenance and calibration. Don't put them behind really heavy stuff that nobody can fit between to get to them. And we recommend putting them in the breathing zone about five feet up off the floor. Um, so this is a diagram showing all of your machinery room requirements. All right. So then let's have another quiz question. Have you guys been paying attention? Let's see. True or false? The audio alarm in your engine room should be louder than the ambient noise in your engine room. True or false? Yeah, that's true. There's no point in having an alarm there if you can't even hear it because the room is so noisy. So it has to be 15 decibels above your ambient noise, five decibels above your maximum noise. Okay, another quiz question. We'll get these out of the way here. Let's see. What level of ammonia is requires a, a first response? Okay, it's a 5,000 ppm, 300 ppm, 25. It's 25 there. Anything below 25, you don't have to signal any sort of alarm or anything. But that's the first level that gets noticed by IIAR. Okay, correct answer is C. All right. So then we've gone over the what are your requirements for your machinery room. Now we're going to talk about outside of your machinery room. There's still places if you've got a pump, a valve, um, condenser, anything where there could possibly be ammonia that leaks from it, you're required to have detection in those areas. Examples would be like freezers, coolers, docks, your protection area, your production areas. That's where we see um, where we install a lot of ammonia detectors. It's the production areas uh, and your air handlers, et cetera. We think these are important because um, this is where your people are. So you want to protect uh, people from your ammonia, from any potential ammonia leak. And then, uh, so here are the requirements for your non-machinery room. Again, here are the codes word by word. Feel free to read those and look them up if you want. But I'm just going to summarize them here. In your non-machinery room, you have to have at least one detector, um, which is set to activate at 25 parts per million. So what does it do? Uh, when it's, um, once it detects 25 parts per million, you have to signal at a monitored location. Um, and, oops, sorry about that, let's go back. And this just shows you, these are not, this is just uh, your evaporator, your normal fans, but this shows you the location. You have to locate that detector 
um, near the in the path of where your ammonia will travel if it's in the room. You also have to make sure it's located in a place that's easy to access. Um, to access, yeah, access for um, maintenance and calibration. So then, um, again, signal and monitor location located there, and then uh, activate your emergency ventilation. And okay, yes, and then this is the part where if there's any chance that the room could possibly, um, during a leak, if it could possibly reach a level of 40,000 ppm or higher, which there's a whole, it details the whole mathematical equation of how much ammonia do you have, how much could leak into here. Um, if there's a chance it could get that high, then you can still have to have a detector and then uh, you have to have emergency ventilation. And then you have to have all of these things too. You have to have your audio visual alarms inside your machinery room. You have to close valves. This is where you're trying to keep that from happening. So you want to signal at 25 parts per million, and then you have to close all your valves um, so that you would stop that leak from reaching that point where your people are. You also have to de-energize your pumps, your non-emergency vans, other motors. So in your indoor equipment pits, uh, anything that's deeper than five feet, um, you have to have level three ammonia detection. And again, that's the strictest uh, ammonia detection. So audio visual alarm, signal monitor location, at least one detector, close your valves and de-energize your pumps, non-emergency vans and other motors. And turn on your emergency ventilation. Your package systems, these are becoming more and more um, popular, common, but this is um, a prefabricated, pre-assembled closed circuit refrigeration system containing all the essential equipment, piping and devices. The package can be enclosed within its case or framework or unenclosed. So um, these usually, the ones I've seen look like, you know, they come, they deliver it to you all in like a trailer and then you put the trailer. Usually uh, the ones I've seen are on top of the roof. But um, here are the codes, the exact word for word codes. But basically you have to have a detector. Actually, if they're outdoors, you don't have to if all the equipment is exposed and outdoors, you don't have to have any detection. But um, if there's any chance people are going to go inside of it, you have to have a detector in there. You have to have audio visual alarms. And oops, click one, two times too many. Um, so you do have to have some alarms for most package systems. So here's um, an example. We have a code book. We call it our ammonia codes and uh, design specifications document that's available online. And this is an example of how you would set up an entire facility. And these are pictures of our equipment. So this is available online along with the whole document. So um, that's another resource for you guys. But uh, basically, this stuff is a little bit complicated. Uh, there's all kinds of unique situations out there. Um, give us a call. We'll help you figure out what you need. And we're here to make sure that uh, you are up to code and ready for any inspection that um, might be happening in your facility. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. That's just me. So thanks again for watching our show and our presentation, I guess, not a show. But uh, we hope you're doing well and give us a call if we can help in any way. Thank you.